He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Back in July, the arts funding outfit Creative New Zealand inadvertently picked a pretty intense week to release a new survey called Visibility Matters, which showed that media coverage of culture was dwindling. And one day earlier, the media had published a flood of stories about the crimes of multi-millionaire arts patron Sir James Wallace, described by many in the media as a worst-kept secret, while his name was still suppressed. But the Visibility Matters survey's finding that arts and culture get just half of the space in our media that's devoted to sport these days, well, that wasn't news to people in the arts. Now, that report was prompted in part by longtime arts writer Mark Amory, who's now the co-host of RNZ's Culture 101, on the air every Sunday at 1pm here on RNZ National. And at the time, he told Media Watch that one of the big problems was that arts events with a PR push behind them did get coverage in advance, but actual critical analysis of them was harder to find. Too much preview, not enough review, in other words. Now, Creative New Zealand has followed up Visibility Matters with another report released this week, New Mirrors, all about ways to strengthen arts and culture media coverage in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And the authors of that will be talking about it on Culture 101 next Sunday here on RNZ National. But in the meantime, one art form which used to generate lots of critical coverage in our media, but now not so much is music. Chris Schultz is a former entertainment editor at the New Zealand Herald and at Stuff, and on his own Substack blog Boiler Room, he recently wrote about paid music writers in our media becoming a bit of an endangered species and local musicians now struggling to get any media coverage at all of their work. So this week, Media Watch's Hayden Donnell asked Chris Schultz, how's that come about and what could be done about it? We've just had a new report out. It's called New Mirrors. It's about the state of arts and culture reporting in New Zealand. In short, things are not looking great, according to this report. Do you share that assessment? It's nice to see that I'm not the only one out there uh, trying to point at things and say, hey, this is a problem. What are we going to do about it? Like, There's actually now a document with research and interviews that says a lot of the same stuff I've been trying to get across in some of my work for the last couple of months. Yeah, Yeah, so that work is mainly focused on basically music journalism, Mm -hmm. how there's very few or no paid music journalists for print in New Zealand. Is that the only issue, though? Uh, If you look at the most recent uh, cuts and restructurings at uh, our two biggest newsrooms, at Stuff and, and New Zealand Herald, Stuff's entertainment team, I understand, and have now been kind of subsumed into the news team, so they are not sort of full-time entertainment reporters anymore. Uh, and then at the Her- Herald, I understand they have one uh, entertainment reporter across the board. There, there was a lot of experience lost in those recent cuts. It's arts across the board. It's film, TV, it's uh, books, arts. It's It's all facets of that coverage. 20 plus years I was covering arts and culture and most, mostly focused on um, the cool stuff, music, film and TV, but uh, you know, we'd cross paths with other writers and covering that other stuff too. They were always there in the newsroom, you know. Can you paint a picture of how things have changed from those early days? <sighs> Yeah, uh, when I started, not only could you be a full-time music journalist, you could choose what kind of music you wanted to cover. If you wanted to cover alternative or hip-hop, you went to Real Groove magazine. If you wanted to cover rock or uh, pop, you went to uh, Rip It Up. There were uh, magazines for, for electronica and dance, remix and pavement. The Herald had uh, its Time Out publication, which started, I think, in sort of 2000, 2001, the early 2000s anyway, and that was like this weekly dump of everything you needed to know in the entertainment world. Uh, there was also arts coverage in uh, Canvas on the Weekend Herald. There was a second Time Out. And I think in your blog you said there was like six roles attached to Time Out. When I left in 2019, there were six of us. There was sort of more experienced heads plus the new younger journalists coming through and we were sort of teaching them the ropes on how to do that. Yeah, that was 2019. I think a lot of those roles were lost because during COVID, obviously, there were no events. So there was no advertising for concerts or movies because no one could go to those things. Uh, The the stunning thing to me now is that uh, it's come back. This upcoming summer is the busiest 
summer for live events I have ever seen. We have 80 music festivals happening this summer. That doesn't include Foo Fighters, Pink, these kind of stadium spectacles. Coldplay announced a show this week. Go look at the power stations lineup of acts coming. It's just, it's chocker. It's it's going off. And, and you wrote in your blog that there was a couple of major music festivals. Eden Fest, I think, was one of them, where just no one attended from the news outlets. There's listen no... in, yeah, listen in was the first one. I, I logged in on Monday morning. I wanted to read about it. Uh, and I couldn't find any coverage. And then the following weekend, Eden Festival out at Mount Smart, same venue, uh, same thing. That was a new festival headlined by 660 and uh, the Fuji singer Lauren Hill, which is a pretty big lineup. Uh, I understand they've got a big crowd. These are, to me, news events. People want to read about them. But is that true? Do people want to read about them? Because these commercial news organisations, they don't make decisions for nothing. Mm. They're obviously in tough economic times. They're looking at the stuff that might not be getting clicks or might not be making money. And they've obviously identified arts and music coverage. Is, is that fair to say? I don't know if it's a, as conscious as that. Uh, you know, I spent 20 years proving to editors that entertainment and, and culture was worthy of coverage and it could work if you did it right, if you did it smartly, if you did it uh, with intention and integrity. If you're, if you're covering stuff online, it's sort of, I don't know, take, for example, Matthew Perry passing away. You're not just hammering that all day. You, you're offering other things alongside it, local news stories, other things for people to read that aren't just things you can get elsewhere. Um, you're putting together, you know, a complete kind of entertainment news package for people. In New Mirrors, though, I think arts coverage is described as the canary in the coal mine. It's not part of what they call the core news and so it's the first thing to get cut when times are tough mm. I, I think it's pretty obvious yeah you're not you're not in here talking to Tover O'Brien about the death of political coverage or Dylan Cleaver about the death of sports reporting and you're kind of so asking great. why why us why not Dylan Cleaver why not you Tova? why not you well yeah but that's my point right like when you don't see I don't know uh, Lord or Tyker on the same pages on the same websites as All Blacks as political figures as business leaders then you're almost saying that doesn't matter that's wrong to me that is absolutely not correct I, I refuse to believe that is it a chicken or the egg situation because I think you'd have some people in newsrooms would, that would say look those stories just don't get clicked but also they're not on the home page so they don't click, get clicks because they're not on the home page and they're not on the home page because they don't get clicks so is it kind of a vicious cycle that's going on here I tell a story about 660 right like the first time I interviewed 660 it was awful they didn't want to be there it was a horrible interview they were a closed book Second time I interviewed them, I said, I'm not doing that. Let's go boxing. I knew they liked boxing. So we went boxing. And that also wasn't a great story. But the third time I interviewed them, this was like six years, right? They trusted me. They brought me into their studio. And that's the story that people still talk to me about. This wasn't like a rock and roll situation. This was like a, an office. They had whiteboards on the wall. They were plotting out this future where they headlined Eden Park and Western Springs. It was a business. And so I kind of covered that like a business story. And... Uh, that took that long, and, and a lot of the people in, especially the music scene, you know, promoters are, are prickly people. They they take time to get to know. Um, you can't just call them up and say, hey, what's going on here? You need to have a relationship with them. And if if journalists aren't allowed to, to build those contacts, you're not going to get those stories. You're not going to get the big stories. And the writers who can do that job of finding other things to do because those jobs aren't there anymore, yeah. Be You're at ease. Consumer NZ, right? I am a Consumer New Zealand reporter now. Like, I'm 45. I'm not sitting here saying, hire me back as a music journalist. I never thought I'd be doing this for my whole life. I never thought I'd be talking about it not happening. I thought I'd be able to, like, either mentor the new writers coming through or enjoy their work, you know. They they should be telling me what to listen to now, not me telling people I'm 45, I've got two kids. You're pretty gutted <laughs> over it, obviously. Yep. Like, what are we losing when we lose this stuff? Um, on a wider context, I always had this kind of feeling that I was documenting. You can go and read from the 80s, Sweetwater's reviews, right? They're still there. If we're not covering Eden Festival and Listen In Festival in 20 years... You can't go back and look at them. You, no one's collating the TikToks and the Instagram reels. You know, I'm 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 of your generation, Hayden. I I grew up with magazines and newspapers, right? I think. Bit older. Stop looking at me like that. Similar. A little, little bit older. <laughs>
I, you know, I, I think there's, I think people still want to read um, about. I have to believe that. I had, I had a chat yesterday with a 60 year old woman in Point Chev who, uh, had she lives there. She'd heard Post Malone playing on Tuesday night, and she went and read. There's two reviews out there for that show on the Herald and stuff. She went and read both of them, and she wanted to have a conversation with me about it. She's 60 years old. People are still interested in what's happening. I think. And, you know, as a journalist, there's good stories there. There's 80 music festivals happening, and I could give you five stories off the top of my head just around trends in those music festivals. Number one, 90% of them are being headlined by men. Aren't we documenting things? Isn't that what journalists are doing? You can go and read about elections from the 2010s, the, the 80s, the 70s, and this stuff just won't be there. There are some solutions on the table in New Mirrors. One of them is just having a dedicated funding pool for artists, uh, stuff like help with their publicity and this kind of stuff. The other one is also probably more interesting for us, which is setting up something like the Science Media Centre, like a dedicated hub that just basically helps organisations with the arts reporting admin, puts a, puts together a calendar of all the upcoming arts events and sets you up with uh, potential people to interview, that kind of thing. Would that help? I think anything would help at this point. Uh, I, I love that idea. I guess I, I guess we can't, you know, having seen newsrooms make these cuts and, and get rid of the, their arts and cultural reporters in such big numbers, we can't really trust them to to bring them back. Well, I think the fee attached to that is something like $5 million a year. Where's that coming from? How that operates. But um, I love the idea. I'd love to be part of it. I, um, I still don't feel like I've had that moment where I've I've helped sort of, you know, like the help I got as a, as a young entertainment journalist coming through from the Scott Carras and the Russell Baileys and the Joanna Hunkins, I haven't been able to do that. I mean, that's how it used to be, right? Like entertainment, arts and culture reporters were there in the newsroom pitching stories, fighting to get on, on those pages. If a good story is a good story, right? You know, it, it still comes back to that to me. If, if we're not putting them up there, next to to All Blacks, to cricketers, to, to politicians, then, yeah, people are going to stop reading them and they're not getting that exposure, so they're not going to get bigger. The other thing, too, I think, right, is that print is often where that hype machine starts, where, where whoever it is on the entertainment spectrum gets a story and someone on radio sees that and says oh, we should have them in. And then someone on breakfast sees that and says, oh, we should get them in on, on the couch next to John Campbell. Like there's this kind of ecosystem there. And when you pull out one of those tent poles, that all kind of collapses because no one's seeing those stories. So the tent is collapsing right now. Totally, yeah. I make you star of music, journalism, <laughs> arts and culture coverage tomorrow. <laughs> Chris, Chris Schultz is the supreme emperor of it. <laughs> What would you do? Uh, quit. No. <laughs> <laughs> Already done that. <laughs> um, I, you, you've got to plug those journalists back into those newsrooms, but they've got to have experience. They've got to have mentors. They've got to have support. And then, and then those stories will come. I, the people who still want to do it, I mean, are they even in at, at journalism school? Is anyone saying, hey, I want to cover music? Like only an idiot would do that at the moment, right? Like that's not a career. There's no career path there in New Zealand anymore. Hey, thank you so much for joining me, Chris. Thanks, Hayden. Hated it. <laughs> that was arts and entertainment writer Chris Schultz, who's also a regular film and TV reviewer on RNZ's Nine to Noon, talking there to Media Watch's Hayden Donnell about music criticism vanishing in our media. Now, the issue of arts coverage and what to do about it was highlighted in that new report this week from Creative New Zealand, New Mirrors, Strengthening Arts and Culture Media in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And you can hear all about that in Culture 101 next Sunday here on RNZ National.